I got, you know, you guys are rock and rock stars in all the ways that you are and all the places you are, Peter Marietta, Peter, uh, David Trader. I'm doubling up on the Peters here. Uh, welcome uh, to Anatomy of a Panel. Glad to be here. Thank you. So, Thank you for having us. You guys, um, you know, one after the other here, and maybe we can start with David. Um, you know, d why comics for you? And maybe I'm sure you've got a story there that you want to share. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I, I liked comics a lot when I was a kid. Um, Honestly, probably the first ones I really remember, my brother had the Star Wars comics when Marvel had that, like those first three issues. In fact, I still have two of the three. I don't think I have one, but they were first, you know, printing. And um, that was the first comic entry for me. But before that, it was like Charlie Brown books and, and Bugs Bunny cartoons. Like as many of those books as I could read, as many of those cartoons as I could watch, that was my entry into comics and, and you know, animation. Um, but there was a long period in between where I didn't really pay attention to comics. When I was in my twenties, I started making films and I was in Los Angeles and it was just kind of a different time. And I didn't even know about Meltdown or, or Golden Apple at that time, you know? So it kind of escaped my, you know, my, my output then. Um, only later when I had the idea for Baby Badass with Christian Horn, did I dip my toes back into it, started going to cons, um, you know, WonderCon, and I've only gone to the last three Comic Cons in San Diego. So it's it's been like as an adult coming back to it, starting over, reading you know Dark Knight and Watchmen and uh, everything else. But I don't pretend to be like a comic book aficionado or nerd, like like Peter. Um, so I know my limitations, but I, I try to be respectful about what came before, and you know what I'm trying to do now. David, was there is there something about comics as a kind of a with a visual dominance as the mode, the means of storytelling that is kind of particularly, um, I don't know, that you're drawn to? I mean, do you think visually, I don't know, I'm just trying to see how, like, you know, you've come into this space and you do this, these amazing things with your, your comics um, as Can a storyteller. Can I ask a question is to follow that up, Frederick? Yeah, yeah. yeah please. It's yep. just because you, you talk, you often talk to me and when we do these shows about that past or um, I'm curious, but what made you want to do baby badass to take that? There's a jump in that timeline from I'm kind of aware right. to I want to do this. It was kind of not knowing any better. Um, this was okay. The idea for baby badass was 2006. My friend, Kristen Horn and I, we were laughing. We're probably drinking. Um, and we were in Big Bear hanging out with a bunch of people and somehow it came up like there's a commercial maybe and a baby and he was like what if that baby was kicking that guy's ass and we just thought it was funny the visual of him jumping around and like being this baby badass and um, it's a stupid idea and I think Christian did a, a, a birthday card to me like the next year and he had like a drawing of baby badass like you know like saying something you know like Clint Eastwood and another two years went by and I said, you yeah, know, well, maybe we should develop this a little bit. And I'll start like writing something. And it seemed natural for a comic book. It seemed like I knew enough about comics that in the nineties people made fun of the pouches and, you know, those characters and those 90 comics. So I was like, well, maybe he'll be like that type of deal. And it'd be not a spoof on comics because I, I have way too much respect, especially in retrospect. Um, mm. But, but certainly kind of an homage to like that kind of genre. It's over the top violence sex mm -hmm. grindhouse you know and i purposely wanted to do that and it seemed like comic books was the perfect forum for it and and Kristen started doing a web comic he had a real baby badass in his life and he had to like pull back and it you know it took years so it was from mm -hmm. 2006 the idea to 2018 when it got published by action lab entertainment that's a long time and i just found the medium I learned a lot to pull back, but I think I love that you can jump from you know panel to panel and really progress a story and tell a lot of information in a fun way. And it's it's a it's a really fun medium. Uh, it's a crazy business, and I give uh, kudos to people that stay in it and, and mm. work in this business because it is not easy and it costs a lot of money to to make comics. Yeah, absolutely, um, Peter. Yes your nutshell kind of why comics? I've uh, loved them since I was a kid. Uh, deeply, um, you know, as we've done a tour of different 
outlets to talk about this book. It's been fun to meet other creators and sort of dive right into the books we loved when we were kids. Uh, I feel like, I think my first comic book was All-Star Comics 58 that I bought. And I think I bought it at uh, Rexall Drugs in Tucson. And I was probably 11, maybe 10. Uh, and I just fell in love with it. And it was an interesting comic to fall in love with because it was the continuing adventures of the Justice Society of America in 1977. And it was a first issue. There was no, the, the, the odd thing for a 10 year old to pick up. There was a book called All Star Comics in the 40s that was the first team up book. And they decided to start it up again with the numbering. Like issue 57 was in 1955. And then the next one was in 1977. And it happened to be the one I picked up. And so it had these older versions of characters that I'd seen on Saturday morning. And it had a really deep narrative about young people trying to break into the Justice Society. And from there, it just grew. Like I know the Star Wars comics Dave's talking about. I remember getting the treasury editions of those. Um, and it taught me how to tell stories. And, you know, I think it also taught me storyboarding. It taught me narrative. It taught me sequential narrative. It taught me um, how to be an episodic TV writer where you're doing different stories every week and you want to advance the story just a little bit. I love it. Yeah. In fact, that leads us nicely into um, kind of the flip side to this, which is that you both, you know, work in other, you know, formats, storytelling formats. And how did, how does that inform your comic book storytelling? So like from the other direction now? Well, from the other direction, I'll go first this time and say that I've had a deep love of the genre as we've just discussed and i even had bought like denny o'neill's book about comic writing i think i bought that i knew i bought the scott mcleod understanding comics and i kind of always wanted to write a comic book and every time i would finish the book i'd finish the dennis o'neill book or i'd finish the 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 will eisner book and i was always left with um this feeling of like give me the template, like somebody give me the template, especially as I became a TV screenwriter because I have final draft as a program. And I was just like, even when I would see examples of it, for some reason, I was always, it was too hard to penetrate. And so when I came up with this idea and I went to Dave, Dave had already written Bad, Baby Badass. And I said, look, I know a lot about comics, but I don't know the format and the writing of it and the pacing I want to get right. And so I wrote it in a script form. Like what I did with the first rough draft was here it is, here's how I see it. And then Dave who's flexible in both was able to start adapting it, uh, adding little bits of his own into it and then getting it back to me to review. And that process really, accelerated my learning and now i just finished my first um you know solo effort for an anthology that's coming out uh that's a horror comic that's going to be all about joaquin marietta's head and uh so i feel like I've, I've i've tried to keep my learning curve at a steep trajectory because i want to do more david yeah um i was lucky in the sense that <laughs> that's how I wrote. I mean, I, I, I've written some feature films, I've written some TV shows, some pilots, stuff that doesn't get picked up. So that was the, the format that I was used to. Uh, but I was lucky that I'd done Baby Badass and I, I had a steep learning curve with that too. I think, um, you know, as you go through and as you work with an artist, in this case, Tim Larson did the, uh, the everything for the first book art wise. And he was really good at showing me like, well, one, he was good at taking notes, but two, it was like, I didn't have to give him notes. After a while, it was like, 
there's a rhythm to uh, what you get with an artist, especially a good artist, if they get what you're working on. I've heard other stories where like there's conflict and um, you know, you have to go back and forth. And I can only imagine that that's, that's a pain uh, for the artist and for the, the writer. But this, is, this was great you know, knowledge to have, even though I didn't have extensive knowledge, the fact that Peter uh, talked to me at one of the cons or something and he mentioned this idea and he was gracious enough to invite me on. Um, I've always looked up to him as a writer and a performer and a producer. Um, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, I added a few things, like he said, I felt more comfortable along the way and that's because he's a great collaborator and I love collaborating. That's like, that's everything I do. I really want to collaborate with good people, funny people and um, make something unique. Yeah, it's really um, excellent that you guys were, you know, so often I think the situations, David, that you're talking about where there's conflict or tension is when someone has imposed the co-creative team. Um, instead of us kind of selecting who our partners are, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could also be a, a matter of they're just not getting it with notes or mm -hmm. there's some kind of communication issue. So um, it, it works well when the two people are on the same page, literally. Yeah. So, David, you've already talked a little bit about Baby Badass, but <laughs> and, I mean, the, con the, the story, the concept, everything is like awesome. And in many ways, it kind of gets at maybe the very heart that beats at the kind of center of comics, um, at least comics like mad, um, you know, um, and that whole tradition of kind of underground comics um, that really t went and took us places that, you know, other narrative forms didn't dare. But could you just give us a kind of like, a, I don't know, elevator version of baby badass and like, you know, <laughs> sure. yeah. He's a, he's a 33 year old super soldier trapped in the body of a baby. He was a secret government experiment that went wrong. Uh, he escapes the lab and he, uh, this, this, this sweet uh, waitress finds him in the middle of the desert. She works in some rundown like uh, strip bar run by these asshole bikers and she finds him, she takes him in and it's revealed that eventually that he's like this super weapon. Uh, and it's just a crazy grindhouse action comedy uh, it's been described as Mad Max meets Idiocracy. So it's funny. It, it was, there was a lot of like action, a lot of over the top violence. Um, but there was a progression too with, I think, issue one through three, which made up the first volume. I tried to do something different. Uh, even though Tim was doing the art in each one, he gave it a different tone, a different look. Um, the second one feels much more like a Marvel meets uh, R. Crumb type of thing. And then, um, the third one had a little more of a graphic novel feel. So volume two is being worked on now and uh, I'm just taking my time. Eventually it'll come out probably in early 2021. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I imagine you've, it's found its readership, right? Its audience. <laughs> it, I don't know. It, it, it's been fun to see that happen. Like, yeah. especially cause there's only the, the one book, but um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of people get it. There was some talk at C, C2E2 that like a lot of the, comic shop owners thought it was something else and then when they got it and read it they they like they were pleasantly surprised that it went into a different direction than maybe initially some people think all right let's talk about the comic that we're here to talk about um so rafael garcia henchman and i i would love for you both just to let's kind of take our time here to talk about this co-creative process that you've um, been sharing, this journey that you both been, have been sharing from idea to writing to like the materialization on the page. And I've got a couple of pages courtesy here of David. Um, let's, let's start from the beginning. So idea, writing, the, you know, you guys talked about the script already a little bit and how you worked on it, um, you know, Peter and then David kind of sending you feedback and then, and now we have a comic. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, to me, it was inspired by the lack of representation in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the lack of representation in the DC Extended Universe, and I wanted to participate in fixing it. I go, at least before the big implosion, the DC implosion number two that just happened, uh, I used to go meet with their TV team, you know, a couple times a year just to see what's up. And we would talk about the various characters 
And it seemed like the one or two Latin characters they had were always locked up in film development. And so I realized I had to do something on my own. And when I take my boys to see the Marvel movies, I always make jokes there and on the way home about the Avengers lawn, like who cuts the lawn. When, uh, when Doctor Strange gets in his cool classic car and it breaks down, who's fixing that car for Doctor Strange? And we kid ourselves about all the jobs, all the invisible jobs done in, in, in that world and it, are they Latinos? And so that was the genesis of wanting to start a character in a universe as a henchman and see what happens and watch him struggle and watch him um, comedically rise to middle management in an organization and see where it can take him. But at the same time, make him really human and have him have relationship problems and just really kind of see what could happen. And so I wrote it and then reached out to Dave and he really liked it. And it's got a humor, it's a humor book. Um, so he was a great partner to bring on and that's how it started. And then David, tell us how we go from the, that space, that place to pages. It's, it's funny because a lot of times you have these kind of conversations and um, someone will tell you an idea or you'll go back and forth on it. And it can take years. Um, this was pretty quick in, in regarding that type of time frame. I would say Peter talked to me extensively, probably not this past summer because they didn't have Comic-Con, but Comic-Con 2019, right, Peter? Yes. Yeah, so 2019, you know, I, he also is very busy. I, I, I was not as busy with some of the stuff I'm working on. So I was able to do some of the legwork too. Like for instance, just putting a wide net out for artists to try to find an artist that could do superhero type stuff because we knew even though it's a comedy book, we wanted to, to have it feel like you're reading one of those Marvel books and, and, and getting the superhero universe, the bad guys, like getting that stuff right and having that same look. We could have gone super indie and had something that maybe would have looked more like a, you know, like a secure image book that was great art, but it didn't ev evoke that universe to you automatically. So actually there was some debate about that. Um, yeah, I remember. Uh, and we went back and forth with it, but I think in the end, the artist we found, Ben Herrera, who does a great job, he actually has experience. He's, he's done like X-Men Adventures and some other big books, and he has that, that flair and that feel um, we just wanted to make sure he could add the facial expressions, the things that, you know, when they do sit down and talk at a coffee shop, that it's not big explosions and stuff like that. So, so he kind of had to, to straddle the line a little bit. And I think he did a really good job. So I did a lot of just that legwork of putting the artist together and, and the team, getting the letterer, Clay Adams does our letters, does a great job. Um, some of the nuts and bolts of putting it together. And then I was able to sprinkle in some of my ideas and, you know, I brought a character in here, or maybe we do a flashback there, stuff like that. And Peter uh, was great about that. So I felt a little more um, co-ownership co of the story, even though it's his creation. Um, and, and that's been a lot of fun. So was there a moment when you got a page, let's, let's start with this sort of first page here, and you, you had to kind of go back to Ben and say, look, uh, the layout's not working or the color palette, or I don't know, were there, was there kind of back and forth there? Yeah, I remember that. Dave, do you remember we had a few pages? There, there, there always is. Um, and do you I remember think, any specifics? Yeah, I think there was maybe a panel where, uh, and this happens sometimes where it's like, oh, well, this guy's speaking first and then, and then he talks again. So you're going to have a bubble that goes under. And I think Clay found a workaround for that. But those are the ideas that you would have to go back and say, what about this? But overall, the look, I mean, he gave us character design first. I think first. there was some, but I think, you know, it doesn't impinge upon anybody to say if there were issues. Like, I remember there being some facial expression comments, the feeling of someone maybe rolling their eyes when we really wanted them to be much more of a smirk or, you know, right. because we really wanted the reaction of these characters to be, you know, the organic things that I saw in my head. So we had a couple of those. Yeah. 
and, and it, but it was a good process. Like it was a healthy process and there's, there was not any like contention. It was just more of like the normal things that you do when you're going through the book. Establishing character here. Um, what are we looking at in terms of character design? Um, <clears throat> well, as David alluded to, we wanted, um, it to look like it could exist in a superhero universe. And so we then wanted it to also feel organic to our world. So we think to ourselves, what does a henchman in the real world look like? Like, it doesn't look like 60s Batman. And even some of the, you know, 90s and 2000s where the different supervillains have their henchmen, they, they had like, the thematics of the outfit almost dominated the utility of it. And with our guys, because it's real in our minds and we want to make it real, uh, it's got much more of a body armor with subtle um, logos and insignias on it, kind of almost like they're a juiced up version of a security team. And a well, it's, it's like paramilitary, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Corporate, corporate paramilitary. Yeah, it's like the Blackwater rebrand after they've been uh right xc or whatever the yeah. whatever that was called moving uh to a couple other pages here um so we have kind of we have our characters we're starting to get into the groove of our characters and the, what differentiates each, each of the characters different maybe psychological um you know configurations and then boom we have right maybe the the beginning of the action uh, uh i don't know yeah tell me walk yeah, me through so this yeah spoiler yeah. Alert, spoiler alert um yeah our hero dies here in the first page <laughs> um it's the general it's the it's the um it's the opening of a bond movie but it's two guys standing around guarding stuff <laughs> And then just like Bond skis off of a cliff into a parachute by an explosion, there's an explosion. There's always an explosion. But it really just interrupts our two guys arguing about what's in the crates that we're loading. So in a way, it also serves, the explosion serves to also tell us who guessed right about what was in the crates. <laughs> That's awesome. And yeah, of course, it's it, it, yeah, it, great water cooler talk. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love it. And it, of and course, brings it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and then Peter. That, you know, I was just going to say, and then, of course, after the explosion, you just said the action starts. They immediately have to scatter and meet up at a coffee shop where they sit. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. I love it. Yeah. Okay. So here we are. And so you guys were talking about we want to put this in a kind of a Marvel story world universe that's recognized as such in terms of art design and style but immediately you are re-engineering those narratives right in all sorts of ways um you know like the the workers are the focus the protagonists and then boom the explosion so yeah let's hear more yeah. about that yeah so you know here we have essentially the our version of the shawarma scene but it leads off our book because it's all about these guys work a day life and they're in a coffee shop where not only are they bemoaning the fact that there's been an explosion, but there's also a discussion of, you know, maybe this guy that works at this coffee shop has a better gig because of benefits and different sort of situations. And there's continuing to explore the sort of, um, core character values of Rafa and his pal. Um, you know, his pal doesn't want to test the waters, likes the job, likes what they got. And Rafa's a little bit of a questionnaire. He wants more. And so we get a little bit of a backstory about what they've been doing, which is the same thing for a long time. Uh, different places they've gone, but they've just gone there to guard stuff. And so it's, again, that deep dive, and repositioning the narrative. We haven't seen the villain yet. You may not see the villain in this. Um, and, uh, you know, we want you to get comfortable with the slice of life that we're uh, showing. David. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything uh, Peter's saying. It is kind of funny that we start with that, you know, that that explosion, and then the action is the coffee shop. Like that's 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 kind of like what you get with some of this. So, again, having the art offset some of the those those settings, those talky settings, I think played played well because you know you kind of do expect like the next page. Okay, now this is where this is going to happen, and. Uh, there is some of that for sure. It is not a talk fest, uh, but it's, it's a, it's a character fest and mm -hmm. there's relationships. And um, I think that makes it really interesting. Uh, you know, I, it's only after seeing the art sometimes and seeing it like this and actually breaking it down where, um, you know, you, you can see that progression even more clearly. Like when you're in it, you're working on it, you want to get it done, you're getting pages and, you know, then you're trying to push it and sell it. Um, you sometimes don't take a step back and kind of examine it this way. And I think Ben did a really good job uh, capturing um, their, the mundane aspect of what they do in an exciting way. And there's a character, my cameo by my um, associate, Danny Trejo, in this scene. Right. As their uh, former leader. Uh, I also think what Dave said made me remember that there's a lot that happens in this book but it's on an emotional trajectory there's a lot that happens to Raphael in this book from beginning to end he's a changed man he's a changed man by the end of the first issue and um he goes through a pretty tumultuous experience quickly yeah it's really um I love it and it works beautifully with I'm just selfishly speaking here, my new formulation about why some superhero or action comic books work and others don't. And the ones that work are the ones that provide these kinds of pauses where we actually have character interaction and even character emotion in ways that the action obviously isn't interested in. Um, and the comics that don't work are the ones that are obsessed with the action. Like the, the narrative is driven to those action points. Um, and I think those just in the end, they kind of, you know, they, they fall on their faces, you know? We always say in the television world, like you have to do what the medium you're in calls for. And I think until CGI existed, the comic book was where you could see the Golden Gate Bridge destroyed and where you could see, you know, Superman holding up a building. So that was awesome. I remember as a kid, you'd see these, yeah, I'm going to throw a crazy name. I think Ross Andrew, who did the Atom. Like you could see the Atom doing these things that were just fantastic. But then along comes CGI, the birth of the Marvel machine. And now we have to think about comic books in a different way, I think. We have to, you know, so I, I agree with your theory. And I would say you have to think about it in a different way. What does it give you? I think that's why, you know, Dave, you, maybe you can tell me if there's one that's more current. But I'd say Invincible is the last sort of superhero book to pop, to become really popular. And that was, as you said, Professor, like, that was all about this struggle with this kid who realized that he was his dad was an alien overlord and he was going to conquer the planet and it was all about that emotional relationship right I, i'd throw the boys in there maybe too a little bit mm -hmm. and how that's been developed into the series um you know you're you're playing well in that case you're you're with them um but you know you're playing around the peripheral too with with these guys that are against them so right. i've always loved that like uh that you know rosencrantz and gilder stern like i i really like that idea in fact i also peter like i wanted to pitch my wonder twins um which was them like on some bullshit mission that they're complaining about and you only see you know the super friends a few times in cameos and it's just like what are these guys doing so henchman's kind of the ultimate um uh end to something like that i also want to give a little bit of credit at least from like my a mind frame when I'm thinking of these guys is in Austin Powers, there was these deleted scenes where they called the wife of a henchman that got run over by a steamroller. And you just see this little tiny peek 
into like these are real people and these are their lives mm -hmm. and of course that was played for laughs and they they ultimately edited those out but i it always stuck with me like i love that idea of like who are the pe the people that you see in the background sometimes like what's that guy got to go home to when he's around this kind of craziness or whether it's superhero or, or super villains yeah it's actually you know now getting me thinking and of course this is so obvious now but um you know watchmen and frank miller's dark knight these extraordinary moments but they're extraordinary moments not only because of the kind of artfulness of the narrative and the drawing but because of the reinsertion of the power of the pause right yes and yeah, yeah. and you know what you can see now as the medium goes to yet another shift, I think that some of the better books, and I'm sorry, I'm such a DC head, but I'm gonna go to like the three jokers that's just issue two just came out and the black label stuff that DC's putting out where they're sort of acknowledging that the slavish idea of continuity is given way to what is the story that you're going to tell that turns this character in a way that you haven't seen before? Like I just finished a book that's Wonder Woman and it posits the idea that, you know, she's the one that can survive essentially nuclear winter. So, you know, she wakes up in a future with very little humans and then you're doing a lot of backfill to figure out why did she survive? And she has to face down her mother and um, she kind of got in, betra she betrayed the Justice League at some point. So it's sort of an emotional reckoning for her. And it's very lovely. And yeah. there's still action and there's battles, but like there are those moments where, as you mm -hmm. say, the pause, the pause is yeah. there. And um, as we kind of wrap this up, cause I know we all have to kind of get on with our lives, but there, let me just add one more thing here. Um, it's also really significant that the pause here that I'm looking at is a pause that focuses on Latinos. See. Because we haven't had the pause. We haven't had the opportunity for the pause in comic book storytelling. No. And it's us being us. Right? I mean, this is our opportunity to sit around and you know shoot the cheese may like let it fly let these guys figure out what's the next move and um that is often not our role right when we even show up we are working or we're on our way to be sacrificed for some greater good um but this is letting us have that voice and it goes on like he has a relationship that needs repair he has decisions to make that he needs to talk to his friends about. So yeah, it is that, and that it means a lot to me. David, Peter, I, what can I say? You're blowing my mind. Um, maybe things that I should have sort of seen earlier in my comic book scholarly career, I'm now seeing really clearly. Um, thank you for taking your time and let's get this uh, Rafael Garcia out into the world. Yeah, it's done. We, we, we're really good. We're last days of funding and um, we hit a bunch of goals and we've got the background you see. I know it's a text, but you'll probably put an image in. Is uh, We're close to letting that poster be available. Yeah, for, everybody, for, for all physical backers. All right, gentlemen, take care of yourselves. I will be in touch. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Bye.